feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in a shrimp tank. But it's a- Welcome back to another episode of The Shrimp Tank. Coming to you virtually from Seattle, the PNW, and now, now, even the Bay Area. I think I'm going to call it Seattle South. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Listen, if you want to learn how to start, grow, or run a successful business, and who doesn't, this here is the podcast for you. I'm calling it the podcast of record. This is where street smarts and book smarts, even audio book smarts, collide. Hi, I'm Dan Whedon, and my co-host today is Linda Popke. Our guest is Nick Johnson. Nick's a returning guest. He's been a few years, though. Nick is the founder and creative director of Libro.fm. Libro.fm is taking on that 900-pound gorilla in audiobooks, and we can't wait to learn more. Welcome, Nick, or actually welcome back, Nick. We'll be talking with you in just a few minutes. Everybody, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and YouTube. As I like to say, we are ubiquitous. Uh, Nick, you might have to spell that. Look it up. We are ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. We come to you from about a dozen cities, including the mothership in Atlanta, Boston, Boca Raton, Charleston, Central PA. Uh, Before we bring on Nick to learn more about him and Libro, I am excited to welcome in our newest co-host, Linda Popke. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Dan. It's exciting to be here. Well, you know, I, I want to mention that for everybody listening or tuning in on the live stream, we have what I call a pop-up Popke. Uh, <laughs> we have about a 15-minute interview we did last Friday Uh, Go to the website, stay on the Facebook, go find that later. Uh, We have a great interview where we learn a lot more about Linda. But Linda, for those of people who want to know right here and now, give everybody about a minute bio on Linda Popke. All right. Well, as as Dan mentioned, I'm in the Bay Area. I'm right smack in the middle of Silicon Valley, uh, where I've been for a number of years doing strategic marketing for both Silicon Valley companies as well as other organizations. And what I do is I help organizations and individuals get heard above the noise. So if we think about um, the marketplace today as being very noisy, everybody's trying to talk at once. How do you get heard above that? Um, You can't talk louder because that just adds to the noise. You have to do something different. Um, So I've written my own book about that, Marketing Above the Noise, and I'm excited to talk to Nick. Uh, And I also help authors um, create compelling content and books and edit their books, produce them, create audio books. So uh, I'm excited to be here and to be part of the team. Linda, are, are any of your books on audio yet? Um, marketing above the noise is on audio. Yes. All right. Okay. Well, I think I, I think uh, you you and Nick may have some talking to do about uh, about audio books. So, Linda, welcome to the team. We're excited to have you, Nick Johnson. Welcome back. It, we did a little digging. January of 2017, which seems like a millennium ago, uh, <laughs> forever, uh, when since you were last on, uh, Nick, what I'd like to, to have you do is to, to give a little bit of an overview of exactly what Libro.fm is and what has changed for you and for Libro in the last four years. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me back. And hi, Linda. Welcome hi. to uh, the show with me. Um, yeah, so Libra FM, uh, Libra FM Audiobooks, that's a company that I co-founded. I, I want to make sure I give credit to my two other co-founders there. Co-founded about seven years ago, and basically we give customers the ability to support their local bookstore while they listen to audiobooks. It's as simple as that. Um, the audiobooks available through us are the exact same audiobooks you get on Audible or any other audiobook platform, same recording, same narrator but you're giving, giving your money back to your local bookstore as opposed to um, Amazon. Um, what's great about it is it could be a book, book, bookstore that's down the street, or it could be a bookstore that maybe you supported back in college or when you've been somewhere else or whatnot. You even switch around and support different bookstores with different purchases, which is pretty cool. What has changed in the last four years? Um, everything, I guess. Uh, <laughs> we've grown, we've grown considerably. Um, Everything is still going in the right direction, which is really exciting. 
Um, the mission has stayed the same in terms of just getting more people listening to more audiobooks while supporting their local community. Um, the last year, year and a half especially, has been pretty dramatic growth. Um, basically, every terrible thing that happened in 2020 was actually beneficial to our business. Uh, people, you know, not going into work, having more free time, listening to more audiobooks, bookstores being closed physically, went to more online sales. Uh, a lot of people wanted to learn a lot more about racial justice issues, and the books were sold out, but the audiobooks were available. So, um, 2020 specifically and the beginning of 2021 were pretty pretty amazing growth years for us. That's great. Nick, I, I've got a question for you. I, I always look at things from the author's perspective. If I've written a book, how do I make sure that my book gets into your distribution chain as opposed to just Audible or somewhere else? Uh, well, the first thing is just don't make any sort of exclusive agreements. So okay. if you do it through Audible and Audible exclusive, then uh, we and no one else will be able to sell it. Um, but if you don't have any sort of exclusives on it, then we just work with your publisher and we already work with uh, every big publisher and hundreds of smaller publishers um, and it will automatically come into our system, uh, you know, depending on what publisher you work with and the, the licensing you have on it. Um, we also work really closely with Findaway Voices and Authors Republic, which is a great way to get your audiobooks produced. And if you get it produced through either of those companies, they're automatically fed into our system. That's terrific. That's great. Nick, talk a little bit about, you know, and I called Audible the 900 pound gorilla that lives kind of next, right next door to us here. But there are some differences, just even in, at least there was when I started uh, as a Libro.fm uh, customer myself on, on the membership trail. There are some differences within the app. And I'm not as familiar with Audible because I only use Libro. Uh, and I highly yeah. recommend everybody does. But I get to keep my books forever. Uh, and I don't know if yeah. that's the case. Talk a little bit about some of the differences that somebody who enjoys listening to books would find uh, different with you? Sure, sure. Well, first and foremost, the main difference is who you're supporting. That's, right. that's more than anything. Right. You're supporting local small businesses and that, that's you know the, the biggest thing. Um, from the listening perspective, it's really not any different. Uh, the book's the same, the narrator's the same, link's the same. The app itself has a lot of the same functionality, being able to speed it up, slow it down, bookmark it, so on and so forth. The differences though, are kind of like what you're talking about um, you own your book. So books through Audible are DRM or digitally rights managed, and you can only listen through their environment. So through their app, um, either on a Kindle-ish device or on a smartphone. Our books are not DRM, so they're DRM free, which means you can listen to it anywhere you want. Now we have an app and it's a fantastic app and it makes it really easy to listen to, but if you want to download the MP3 files yourself and you want to put them onto a different device, you want to burn them onto a CD. Um, a lot of our customers are uh, visually impaired, so they put the MP3s onto a specific device for people with visual impairments. You can do all of that through um, us. So that's one part of it. The other part is you never lose your books. So if you have an account with Audible and you decided to you know, cut all ties with Audible and Amazon and close all your accounts, you lose those books. They're gone forever. So if you're really, in essence, renting it from Amazon, for us, again, since they're downloadable MP3s, if you want, you could download all those beforehand, and then delete your account, and they're actually actually your books. So it's it's really true ownership. Um, the last differentiator I'd like to point out is that uh, when you have a question and you reach out to support, you're going to talk to a real person. You're going to talk to a real audiobook book loving person, and that's definitely something that Audible cannot say. Wow. Lots of good stuff there. I, I have to ask you, Nick, because um, mm -hmm. I don't know you as well as Dan did, how did you get into this? What made you decide to go off and create Libro FM? Sure. So really it was, um, so it was me and two of my friends um, from college. We went to the University of Washington. We're Huskies. And uh, we lived together. And, you know, we, we had very different skill sets that complemented each other well. One guy was a business major. One guy was a computer science PhD, myself in branding and marketing. So we always had this idea of starting a business together. We never quite had the right idea. We would come up with something and we would go get some beers and tear it apart and it would never turn into anything. Well, one of them, um, our CEO, Mark, he is in publishing. He has a boutique publishing house here in Seattle called Pear Press that's published a number of bestsellers. 
And he was wanting to promote the audiobook of his bestsellers because he saw that audiobooks were growing dramatically. Audiobooks are growing about 30% year over year, where print sales are growing slightly and ebooks have really plateaued. They're just kind of staying where they are. So he wanted to promote the audiobook and he wanted his author as he's traveling around to the different bookstores to talk about the audiobook, but he, the author couldn't because by promoting the audiobook at that time, you were promoting Amazon. Uh, because there was no other option and no one was buying audiobooks on CDs or whatnot anymore. So he saw this kind of niche market where, hey, I could do something good for the world and help out these independent bookstores who are not able to participate in this growth right now and give customers another option and give authors another option too. And so that was the genesis of it. Um, we met at a bar uh, at Third Place Books, actually in Ravenna, they have a downstairs bar. And that was where we initially discussed the idea and tried to poke a bunch of holes in it and really couldn't, and the rest is history. It was the original business plan on a napkin. That, that's a great story. <laughs> pretty close, yeah, pretty close. Uh, that, that implies we had a business plan to start out with, but yes, the original idea was probably on a napkin. So I wanna, I wanna piggyback on, on Linda's great question with this. Work, you work with independent bookstores. And yes. in my head, and I'm thinking of us here in Paulsboro, Washington, there are what seems to be an immense or countless numbers of independent bookstores, not only all over the country, but all over the world. Yes. How did you market this to be in a, in a situation where you could, you could access any of these small, not, not, not always small, but independent yeah. bookstores, whether they be in Seattle or in Jupiter, Florida, or San Francisco, yeah. or wherever they might be? Yeah, so in, in some ways it was easy, but in some ways it was hard. Uh, it was hard in the sense that bookstore owners, they've been burned by, before by other tech services, and so they were really kind of reticent to, you know, who are these young guys coming in, what the heck are they talking about, sort of thing. Um, so for us, it was really building personal relationships with these bookstores. And we kind of targeted the top 10 to 15 bookstores in the country in terms of uh, performance and how well they're known and whatnot. And we just started to talk to them and kind of tell them, hey, what we're thinking of building and what would you actually want us to build? And we spent three years just working with bookstores in terms of trying to figure out what would be the best system that matched the vision of what we were trying to build, but then what actually matched what they need on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I remember going to one of the trade conferences with like five different concepts and meeting with stores and unanimously, they all kind of picked this one concept, which is what we ended up building. Once we got over that initial hurdle, um, one thing about the independent bookstore industry is everyone knows each other. It's very small and it's very close knit, which means if you do something wrong, everyone knows it. But if you do something right, everyone knows it too. And so as we started having some success in some bookstores and these bookstores got to know us and see that we were you know, legit and really trying to help them out, um, other stores would hear about us. They'd ask me, you know, they would start talking about it amongst themselves. And it really all grew word of mouth. And it was just stores saying, hey, I spoke to you know, Bob at you know, Changing Hands Bookstore and they love you, we wanna sign up. One of the key things for working with the bookstores is it doesn't cost anything to partner with us, which is great. Um, they never write us a check, it's just us writing them checks. Um, so that's something we're really excited about because it allows them to participate without any risk on their own end. You know, every bookstore, if for some reason it's not working out for them, they can drop out, um, which we have never had happen. And we have over 1500 partner stores now. So how does, if I was an independent bookstore and I'm not on your list already, how do I get involved? How do I become part of this wonderful program? Yeah, sure. Generally, uh, bookstores hear about us, either from a, another bookstore or a customer will have heard about us and they want to support their bookstore and their bookstore is not on our list. So basically, when a customer comes to Libro to create their free account, it says, hey, what bookstore do you want to participate or do you want to support? And we show them, you know, any bookstores that are within 50 miles and then they could search and whatnot. If they go through that process and they don't see their favorite store, they, we have a little message that says, hey, email us, let, them, let us know who you want to talk to or who want, you want us to talk to, and we'll reach out to them. Um, so a lot of it is just that word of mouth. It's us going to a bookstore and saying, hey, this customer really wants to support you with audiobooks. Why don't you partner with us? It doesn't cost you anything. And the normal answer we get from bookstores is, I've been meaning to do that for years. I've just been so busy. Let's get it done. 
Well, Nick, what we have to get done now is pay some bills. We're going to take a short break to hear from today's Spotlight sponsor. And when we come back with our guest, Nick Johnson from Libro.fm, for our Hot or Not section of the show, we're going to see what Nick thinks about self-publishing. Don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of The Shrimp Tank. Does this sound like you? I'd love to write a book, but I don't have the time. In fact, I'm not sure where to even start. Maybe you have a compelling story to share or valuable advice for clients and prospects. If only you could get that story out of your head and into a published format. Think you don't have time to write a book? Think you aren't a good enough writer to get your message across? Think this all sounds overwhelming? Think again. At Leverage to Market Associates, we help aspiring authors transform that long stuck book idea into an attractive published work. If you've written most of your book, we can help edit your work and drive it through the production process. If you're not sure where to start, we'll coach you through the creative process to organize your thoughts and create a compelling book outline. And if you're just not comfortable writing a book yourself, we can ghostwrite it for you. Contact Leverage, Mar Leverage to Market Associates for a complimentary evaluation of your nonfiction book concept today and bring your book to life. Great, thanks. Well, welcome back to the, to the Shrimp Tank where we interview the best and brightest CEOs and business thought leaders in the greater Puget Sound area and beyond. I'm Linda Popke and our guest today is Nick Johnson with Libro.fm, and our next segment is Hot or Not. You know, Linda, I, I actually think we might have to talk our producer, Barb, into doing some audio book narration. That's nice. She, 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 might, have to, she might have to pick that up as a, as a side hustle. Uh, <laughs> Nick, well, here's what we're going to do with Hot or Not. You remember this. Linda and I are going to mm -hmm. pepper you with questions about books, about business, about life. Who knows what else? And, you know, I know a little bit about you, so you more than I did four years ago. So you might want to be a little bit careful. And at the end, you win absolutely nothing. Uh, you know, Nick, uh, when I started in consulting about 16 years ago now, we were all talking, you know, we were all taught, you got to get a book out there. And, and Linda probably remembers it, it needed to be commercially published. There was this big push to have the, the commercially published book and you sometimes got an agent or you know something like that and you went through that, all that. Uh, things have changed though. I guess I'm gonna ask you just straight out, hot or not, self-publishing. Uh, I think it's hot. I think it's great. There's a great opportunity for self-publishing um, specifically with audiobooks because it's a great way to promote yourself. Um, I checked, Linda, your book, Marketing by the Noise, is available on Libra FM. So, you know, imagine Linda, um, not that Linda's a self-published, but imagine Linda is a self-publisher and she wants to send out um, 100 copies of her book to friends or family or give it uh, to clients or whatnot. If it's a physical book, you have to order those 100 copies, you have to get them mailed in, you have to package them, you have to address them, you have to send them out. Linda's not in her head, she's probably done this. But with an audio book, uh, we can work with you, make one code that's available for you know, 50 downloads or 500 downloads or whatever, and you can send that email to your email list and say, hey, download my book, check it out, hear what I have to say, so on and so forth. So um, I think self-publishing is hot, and especially in audiobooks, because it's a great, low-cost way to get that message in front of you. Hey, Linda, before we, we go to your uh, first hot or not, I'm going to do a quick follow-up here. I know Nick and I are going to be playing golf in a couple of weeks, and I may have to pepper him with these questions as we walk, walk around Chambers Bay. But, okay, so I've got my Unleashed Leadership book. Captain Jack and I wrote, wrote it together, and I've got some other books out. None of them are on audiobook. Uh, how would somebody like me... A, and I know this is a little self-serving, but some of the other people might be interested. Uh, how, how would somebody like me all of a sudden say, okay, I'm willing to narrate my own book. Where do I start? How do I do it? Nick? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was a question for Linda. Um, no, no. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> no, I yes, just, uh, no, it was a question to, for you. Uh, so somebody came to you and said, how would yeah, I do yeah, this? Yeah. Oh, I, I was still listening. I just wasn't, uh, okay. I wasn't ready to answer. Uh, <laughs> it's a great question. Um, we actually have a really great uh, page on our website 
if you go to LibreFM slash authors, um, and the, the link is in the navigation also, that is a great page on the website that gives you a great kind of starting point about how to market audiobooks, how do you get started. We have links to a few different ways to get your audiobook produced, um, whether you have a narrator or not. There's a few different options like uh, Offer to Public, Find Away Voices, uh, Ingram and um, Zebralution, I believe is the name of the company. And then also explains different ways that we can help you market your audiobooks. So um, if you're thinking about doing it, uh, that's a great place to start. And what's really cool about partnering with all of those or any of those companies is it doesn't just put your audiobook on our platform, it puts it on any platform out there. So you know, we obviously want you to promote Libre FM, but as an author, it's better to be in as many places as possible. So that brings a follow-up question because I get asked this by authors all the time. Should I be narrating my own book? So hot or not, <laughs> narrating your own book? Uh, I would say kind of hot, kind of not. <laughs> it, really, it really depends on your voice. Uh, some people have just fantastic voices for narration and some people don't. Uh, I would probably not narrate my own book. I don't think I have the best voice for narration. So that definitely factors into it. Um, the second thing is the type of content it is. Um, you know, if it's a memoir, you know, maybe narrating it yourself makes more sense. If it's a business book, then I don't think the, you know, depending on if it's like from a really personal perspective, I don't think it's quite as necessary. So it's really a balancing game. And there's some fantastic narrators out there. I actually just met with one on Monday who is a prolific narrator, narrates about 100 books a year. And I mean, it is a skill set. That, uh, that they are very, very tailored to do. So you know, if you're gonna spend the money on a professional narrator, I think it's well worth it. Great. All right, Nick, hot or not, printed books. Very hot, I love printed books. I read printed books uh, probably about as much as I read audio books. I think they're absolutely fantastic. So let me ask you this then, I, you, cause you mentioned it a little bit earlier about uh, the, the Kindles and kind of plateauing out. Uh, what would be hotter between a, a Kindle book or, or a, a printed book? Well, for me, it's print, but really it's personal preference. You know, I know a ton of people who uh, read on Kindles and eBooks and such, and that's awesome. Um, you know, I'm all for that. I don't really care for it, but I also spend all day staring at a screen. <laughs> so when I'm in my off time, I don't want to look at a screen. So a printed book or an audio book, it's an audio book, you're not actually looking at the screen. You're, you know, I'm working on my car or doing whatever I'm doing. Um, but I, I think books in any format is just fantastic, especially if you can get that book through a local bookstore, whether it's an ebook, printed book, audiobook, they're all hot in my opinion. Great. So one more. Um, and, and I've got my own view on this, but I've let you we talked about self-publishing, but how important do you think it is to get an agent to help you publish your book commercially? When I, I think my book years ago, it was really important. I don't know that it's the same anymore. Well, I think it, it again depends on your skill set. Um, if it's completely new to you and marketing's new to you and you don't really know where to start, an agent could be a fantastic resource. If you are pretty tech savvy and social media savvy and marketing savvy, um, you know, you could probably do that on your own um, with some pretty good success. So it's really your comfort zone. If it's all new to you though, and you've never had an agent before, they're gonna help you avoid a lot of the pitfalls that you know, you things you don't even know that you don't know. Um, so, you know, I would say agents are for the most part pretty hot. Great. All right, so Nick, uh, getting away from hot or not a little bit, I think something that is very hot is, is something that's pretty brand new uh, to Libro.fm. We were talking right before we came on live about a, a brand new business program that yeah. Libro has going on. Please share with everybody who's either listening or watching. Yeah, so we, we kind of recently relaunched our Libro FM for Business program. More, more than anything, we just kind of branded it Libro FM for Business because we've been doing it for a while, but it was kind of under the scenes. And it was basically working with different businesses or organizations, it could be nonprofits, schools, whatnot, um, giving them a way to provide audiobooks to their employees um, as a HR benefit or a continued education benefit. Um, what's really cool about it is that the company or the organization can curate the list themselves so they can say you know hey here's 10 different books that we want to make available to our um, our employees or 100 different books whatever that number is and 
it could really respond to what they're interested in promoting as a business. Um, we had a lot of this last year with businesses trying to educate their employees on racial justice issues, especially when those books weren't available in stores. Um, they could be different business books or they could be um, health and wellness books. Um, so we're really, really excited about that. We've worked with a number of companies like Nike and Microsoft and LinkedIn and whatnot. Um, so we already have that program running with them. But the most exciting part about it is that when a business partners with us and they you know, choose which books they want and how many books per month they're gonna make available to their employees, they also get to choose a bookstore or bookstores to support with that. And we send 10% of that profit to the bookstore. So what's really cool is you may have a company like Nike based in you know, Beaverton, Oregon, and they, there's a bookstore you know, in their town that all of a sudden gets a check for a couple thousand dollars. And that bookstore didn't have to do anything, but Nike has chosen to support them for at least that month. And Nike might choose to support a different store the next month and so on and so forth. So that business program is something we're really, really excited about. Um, and uh, if you want to learn any more about it, LibreFM slash business, uh, we have a link to it in the navigation. Um, it's really, really cool. And it's a great way to, uh, you know, as a company to reward your employees and help educate you and do continual education for your employees and support local businesses. So is there a minimum number of books that I have to push out to my employees to be involved in that program? Is it 50, 100, more than that? Yeah, it's more than that. So it's, um, I think we have all the details on the business page, but what we do is basically we, um, you buy what are called, we call them tokens. And these mm -hmm. tokens can be redeemed for a book. And it's a minimum buy of 500 tokens. Um, now those tokens don't have to all be used in one month. They can be spread out over the course of six months or a year or so on and so forth. But that is the initial buy-in is 500. So it's you know, obviously for really big companies, MailChimp and Microsoft and so on and so forth, it's pretty easy. Smaller companies, it's a little tougher, but then again, you can stretch it out over time. So Linda, I'm gonna let you do one more uh, hot or not or, or your question uh, before we head off into another break. Oh boy, let's see. So um, just in general, in terms of, of hot or not, um, we talked about we talked about um, hardcover books or, or or paperback books. We talked about narrating your books. We talked a little bit about sub publishing, but what do you see um, in terms of um, books being um, be, being um, created by um, people who hadn't been there before? So you talked about social justice. Do you think it's hot that we're seeing kind of first time authors who are creating something and putting it out there, or is that not happening as much? No, it's definitely happening. I love uh, first-time authors and independent authors, and that's really the the key to independent bookstores. Is independent bookstores can give first-time authors um, a platform that they would probably not reach if they were going through Audible or Amazon or something like that. Audible and Amazon they really focus on the you know the, the sure things, the celebrities and whatnot. It's the independent bookstores that discover that new upcoming author that maybe no one's talking about. And they, they say, oh man, this book is amazing. And they tell their other booksellers and then the booksellers tell the customers when they're coming in. And so I think new authors, you know, people who've never written before and want to, um, I think that's super hot. And you know, using bookstores, independent bookstores and booksellers to help promote that um, is e equally hot. And I, I think also what's hot, Linda, is somebody uh, using leverage to market uh, as that first time as that first time author <laughs> to uh, to have them help, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, well, we think it's hot, and a, a lot of the people I work with are first time authors, and so, uh, and they're not sure how to do that. So, um, so it's good to know that we have a way to get audio books out there as well as eBooks and printed books, etc. Well, especially if they're trying to reach a younger audience, because younger audiences are becoming more and more, uh, they, they like audiobook more and more, you know, kids, kids now, kids these days, I sound like an old man, but <laughs> kids these days, you know, are born with a, with a earbud in, and they're listening to music, and then they're kind of graduating to podcasts, which are kind of longer format like this, and then they're graduating to audiobooks. Well, and you know what, before we go to break, I want to talk about actually one of my favorite authors, uh, somebody who I buy a lot of books off of Libro on, and that's Malcolm Gladwell. And Malcolm Gladwell just recently came out with his new book, The Bomber Mafia, uh, which is fantastic. The interesting thing that he did, and I'd like to get your take on this, is that 
it, it, it never started as a, a, a real book, so to speak. He, sure. he built this as a, a podcast style book. And, and now it's actually, it's going into a printed form, but it didn't start that way. And I'm wondering, do you think that's maybe a wave of the future where the book starts out as an audio book podcast styled book, and then maybe later goes into a, a printed version? Yes, I think that is becoming more and more um, prominent. Obviously that happened with Malcolm Gladwell's. Um, I think Eric Larson, uh, who is the author of Dead Wake and a number of other fantastic books, Devil in the White City and whatnot. Uh, he's also releasing an audiobook soon called No One Goes Alone. And same thing, it's an audiobook. Uh, I believe it's an audiobook before it's a print book. Um, what is really cool about that, specifically with the Bomber Mafia and Malcolm Gladwell, is it's not just him reading the book. There's there's radio segments, there's sound effects, it's an immersive audio experience. Um, and you're seeing a lot more of that. And I think a lot of authors are starting to realize that, hey, you can add to this experience by including multiple narrators or, or uh, music. Another um, book I read re recently by the actor and comedian Seth Rogen, he wrote a memoir called Yearbook. And that one breaks into skits every once in a while. When he's like talking about his parents and growing up, there's all of a sudden a skit of people, you know, pretending to be his parents and what it was like in his childhood home. And that's something you just can't get with print books. So I think that's going to be more and more prevalent as we move forward. Well, what's still prevalent is taking a short break, and we're going to do that right now. We're going to take that short break to hear from our corporate sponsors. And when we come back with our guest, Nick Johnson, for our famous plea, the fifth section of the show, we're going to ask Nick to uh, jump in the DeLorean and uh, go back in time to see about some special advice. Don't walk away. We'll be right back with more of the Shrimp Tank. Plead the Fifth is brought to you by our corporate sponsors. Ideal Life 360, Cornerstone Financial, First Underwriters Insurance, and the Kitsap Sun Newspaper. Please visit our website at www.shrimptankpodcast.com forward slash Seattle to learn more about these terrific companies. Now, back to the show. Hey, all right. Um, so thank you. Um, um, for, for being here, um, Nick, and we have one more section we want to do. Um, we want to, um, to do this plead the fifth section, uh, <laughs> where we ask you um, some things that you may or may not want to um, want to talk about. And well, we I, I remember this. Oh, you remember <laughs> this one. And I'm going to ask Dan to go ahead and, uh, and start with the first first question here. Not, not a problem. Happy to do it. Uh, Nick, as you know, we're going we're gonna to pepper you with more questions. You have the right to plead the fifth, but you only get to plead the fifth once. After that, we can really throw some things at you. I told you, to, you know, we're going to send you back in the DeLorean, right? And uh, we're going to send you back to whenever it was you, you were 18 years old and graduating from high school. What would Nick Johnson today give for advice to an 18-year-old Nick Johnson back then? Uh, invest in Apple. <laughs> kind of like Forrest Gump did, right? That I guess. That yeah, was exactly. Funny. Invest in Apple. That was a uh, what was that? 1999. Uh, so that probably would have been a good time to do that. Um, no, what would be advice? Uh, you know, I feel like I followed my advice. My advice was uh, kind of like you know, follow my passion. My passion was art. Uh, a lot of people are, were kind of wondering how I was going to make a career out of you know studying art because I studied painting and sculpture and such and but I followed that passion and and I'm still you know obviously it's my art is now mainly on a screen but I'm still the creative director and still doing that so I think I'd probably tell myself what I, I don't think I overtly said it to myself back then but I think I felt it so I'm going to ask you a follow-up question to that because mm -hmm. yeah you're doing art which is great but none of us have this perfectly straight career path so yeah. tell us about some of the things that didn't quite work out the way you might have wanted to and what that taught you in terms sure. of being successful. Yeah, so I started out, uh, I knew I wanted to go into art. I studied fine arts, but I realized I wanted to go into graphic design uh, because I wanted to actually make money. Um, so I kind of geared my fine arts education to graphic design uh, because I didn't, I didn't go to graphic design school. And I started at an internet, uh, as an internet, a really um, high-powered design 
in branding and marketing from Seattle. And I basically worked my way up the ladder there uh, for nine years, you know, with kind of partner uh, goals, aspiring to be a partner. And then that changed really quickly. And, um, you know, the business just shifted a little bit. And I realized, especially as my family was growing and I wasn't seeing them as much as I wanted to, uh, that that wasn't where I wanted to be anymore. And that, you know, I went from nine years of building towards something to a two month period of saying, nope, I want to abandon that and go off and do my own thing. And uh, so that was a real big shift, still the same direction in terms of doing creativity and design. But that was a huge shift. It was very scary. Uh, I started my own design business at the same time that I started Libro. And then they both, you know, the design business took off right away where Libro has been like a marathon. Um, but making that decision to go out on my own and kind of trust in myself and trust in my own skills was difficult. And then, you know, two, three years later, making the decision to shut down the design business, which had been extremely successful. Uh, but to shut that down for this Libro thing, which was, you know, had a lot of potential, but I wasn't really making any money off it at the time, but it was more what I wanted to do with my life. It was who I wanted to support local bookstores. It was working with friends and so on and so forth. Uh, making that decision was also pretty difficult, but, um, you know, I had, I had some great support. Uh, my wife was very, very supportive and um, it worked out in the end. So Nick, we've been asking each of our guests this year, one of the same questions going to get, gather, maybe we'll turn them into a book, who knows? Look, I, I know you've got an entrepreneur spirit. Right now we're gonna ask you to start another business, to start a new business. Okay. If you were to start a new business based on a hobby, what would that new oh. business be? Oh, on a hobby, gosh. Well, I like woodworking and doing mechanical things, working on my car or my, um, motorcycles. So I would probably, it would probably be a new business somewhere in that line, probably the woodworking sort of thing. I, I really enjoy woodworking, building furniture. I'm not that good at it, but uh, I like it. So I, think I thought you were going to go Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance there for a second. <laughs> that's but, great. Uh, that's that's great. been that's written fine. already. That's been written already. <laughs> that has yeah. been written already. So yeah, yeah I, I've noticed that my favorite hobbies have absolutely nothing to do with screens. Yeah. You know, yeah. my hobbies are grabbing a wrench and getting all greasy doing something. So but you, you shut down the business you're running yourself and you're now in a business with partners. Yes. If your partners could give you some advice, the one thing you could approve on, what would they say? What would they say Nick should be doing differently or better or whatever? Uh, more responsive to emails. <laughs> like I, actually, it's not even responsive to emails. Um, this is, I think... Uh, a common trait among a lot of designers is we're brainstorming the next thing and you know whatever the next thing is and in a tech company that next thing may be six months or nine months or two years away but if it's really really exciting next thing i'll start designing it right away just because i want to because I, I, it sounds interesting and all that so i think my uh, my partners would say uh, slow your roll hang out a little bit uh, <laughs> That, that, that part of the process, we'll start that later, you know? So I, I think I get a little bit excited sometimes. I'm like a puppy. <laughs> so Nick, you know, when you were back at the University of Washington and I'm, I'm a Husky too, although I'm a few years ahead of you, you, you mm -hmm. did a, you're, you're a cyclist too. You like to, to bicycle and you did a cross country uh, bicycling ride. Uh, I, I remember it was for, a, what you said it was for a, uh, for a charitable type of thing. Uh -huh. I know there's got to be a, a gazillion stories in there. What's the craziest, weirdest uh, thing that happened to you during your cross-country bike ride? Sure. So, um, yes, I did a, a, it was called, is called, still happens to this day, called the Journey of Hope. And it's through an organization called, uh, it was called Push America. They're since called uh, the Ability Experience. And it raises money and awareness for people with disabilities. And we rode from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. It took a little over two months. Uh, you're riding about 85, 90 miles a day. And then when you're done riding, you're hanging out with people with disabilities. You're meeting with mayors, city councils, trying to raise money and, and programs for their local um, organizations. And it was at one of those. It was at a, what we call the friendship visit. And we were playing baseball. I think we're in New Mexico. And uh, it was 
not necessarily weird. It was more eye-opening and um, heartwarming. And we were playing baseball and there was this young boy and he was not more than two, three feet tall. He had some growth defect where he, um, he was very, very small. He had no hands. Um, his, his joints were a little bit, a uh, little bit messed up. So he kind of moved differently, but he was playing in the outfield with me. I think we're at second base and he was just a super nice kid. He was so, so positive and so happy. And, you know, on the outside, you look at all the stuff this kid's dealing with and you're like, man, how, how are you not just sad all the time? How are you not depressed? Um, but he was just the most, you know, just the happiest kid in the world. I remember at one point the ball came, you know, rolling to him. And he, he had a mitt that was just kind of on his arm, you know, again, no hands. And he like threw the mitt down in front of the ball and stopped it, bent down, picked it up between his forearms and like spun through it like 10 feet to me. And I caught in my mitt and we got someone out at second base or whatever. I remember just that whole experience of like this kid's outlook and his perspective uh, was amazing. And the way that he, you know, could do everything that anyone else could do. He just does it in a different way than we're used to was just so eye-opening to me. And I've just loved that experience, that bike ride. And I've tried to continue with that kind of philanthropy in my whole life and specifically around helping people with disabilities and whatnot. I think it's just amazing. That's powerful. That's powerful. I just wanted to say, I did not go to the University of Washington, but I have a live Husky at my feet. <laughs> so we are Husky here too. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And hey, Linda, can't. before before I know it, we're getting close to the end, and I know you're about to ask Nick uh, uh, contact information, but I have one thing to to add before then. It's kind of a special announcement. I will make it the, the last thing for Nick before we go to contact. Uh, we are now Shrimp Tank is is going to be an affiliate for Libro.fm. Uh, we have all the information how to do that. We're going to be getting it on our website and out on our social media. So we're happy to say anybody who's a Shrimp Tank. Uh, podcast listener, follower, you'll be able to access Libro.fm on our affiliate page. Uh, I want, I want Nick, I want you to tell them a little bit about uh, how that's going to work uh, and, and, and kind of highlight that. In addition, I, we're going to start doing a book of the week and either one of the, my co-hosts or I will, will introduce that book of the week. But Nick, I'd like you to give, to lead us off what would be your book of the week and uh, what do affiliates uh, or what do, what do people go on through affiliates? Do you get anything special? Sure. First of all, um, so affiliates, I believe we have a two for one offer with you going on. I, I okay. probably should have looked at this before. And That's I all right. What it was. Um, but yeah, when affiliates come to Libro and they type in their promo, promo code, which I believe is Shrimp Cake Seattle, but you're going to share it on social media. Right. So it'll be perfect. Uh, you basically get a free book with that, which is great. You start your, your membership, you get a free book. Um, you still get to support independent bookstores. You get to support the podcast. Um, so it's just, a, it's a win-win all the way around. So in terms of that, uh, a book I would suggest, I probably not a surprise as a um, owner of an audiobook company, I listen and read to read a lot of books. It's pretty amazing how many books I go through. Um, and I could give recommendations across the board because I listen to every type of book you could think of. Um, being the audience that we have right now, I'm going to focus in on a specific business book. There's a ton of great business books out there, but I'm going to go old school and I'm going to go with Let My People Go Surfing, which is by Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia. I believe it was originally written around 2000. Uh, the second edition came out about three, four years ago. And um, I usually read it every, every five years or so. It's just a great way to view your business and, and being a business that stands for something. It was part of the drive for us to become a social purpose corporation, which we became this last year, where we could kind of balance social causes along with for-profit causes. It's like a hybrid between a for-profit and a non-profit. Um, it's the within Washington, the social purpose for corporation is the final step to becoming a B Corp, which is something that we aspire to because we want our business to not only do good, like helping local bookstores, but be accountable for the good that we do um, and becoming a social purpose corporation and a B Corp does that. And a lot of that comes from that book, Let My People Go Surfing. It's just amazing. That's fantastic. So Nick, thank you so much for being a guest here on the Shrimp Tank. 
And for anyone who wants to get in touch with you or learn more about Libro FM, how can they get that information? Sure, go to uh, Libro.fm, so www.libro.fm, and you can find all about our company. You can um, you know, see, you can find a bookstore to support. You can choose from over 200,000 audiobooks. If you want to talk to me specifically, it's Nick, N-I-C-K, at Libro.fm. That's one of the joys of being a, a founder is you get the, the first name email. We are since beyond that now uh, as our company has gotten bigger, but some of us still have that first name email. So nick at Libro.fm and shoot me an email. That's fantastic. And for all of you listening and watching, make sure you check out the replays on shrimptankpodcast.com forward slash Seattle and wherever you get your podcasts, such as iHeart, uh, Apple, Google, Spotify, etc. cetera. Um, and follow us on our show's social media pages on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Hey, Nick, thanks for being back uh, in the tank with us again. It was great to, to have you here. Linda, welcome to the tank. Uh, great first Thank show. You. Thank you for uh, joining us. I know we'll see you next month. Uh, for everybody else, look, you need to, to be on the Facebook page, just like what we're doing now. We live stream every Wednesday. The, the shows come out on podcast later, but we live stream every Wednesday. Our next show will be Wednesday, September the 8th. Our guest will be David Leonard, who is CEO of Cytel Systems. They're a managed service provider, so we'll learn a little bit more about David and Cytel Systems. But in the meantime, please be safe, be well, be prosperous, read and listen to a lot of books, because until next week, the shrimp is back in the tank. So long. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond.